is Michael Corley. Uh, he's uh, currently the person in charge of the Conestee Nature Preserve. Michael uh, began his career as an environmental lawyer, working for a decade for an organization dedicated to using the legal system to protect the environmental resources. In January of 21, he left that position to take over leadership of the organization that owns and operates the Conestee Preserve. Prior to defending law school, Michael earned an engineering degree from Clemson University. He's also an adjunct professor here on environmental law at Furman University. He's married, resides with his wife and one daughter. And he says he enjoys being outside and going through nature. And I think he's had a perfect job. Lucky for him. Michael, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm uh, good. All right. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Uh, I love Ollie. Um, I've been here before, and you know, now that I'm 40, uh, it's rare. It's more and more rare for me to be the person in a room. That's very exciting. Uh, I'm here to talk to y'all. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> So I, I'm the director of Conti Nation Preserve, which is a place, right, of course, uh, but it's also an organization. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that owns and operates our uh, 640 acre nation preserve with um, more than 13 miles of trails, an education program, and a bunch of stuff that I'll tell you about uh, in our presentation. Right? We're, we have we have a very little identity confusion very often and we're adjacent to the town park, but um, we are a nonprofit organization that operates through uh, grants and donations. And I would uh, not be very How many of y'all have are familiar with Constantine? I had this one ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I was about to say something that y'all don't know, but uh, give it a shot. <laughs> All right. So, of course, uh, some of you may know it, it used to be called Lake Conestee Nature Preserve. Uh oh, it's not advancing. There we go. And the reason why it's called Lake Conestee is because there's a new dam, right? The old Conestee Dam was the dam, and it, and it was here that was um, built to, to, to create a lake and supply power to the old Conestee Hill. So that dam is 130 years old, um, much to my dismay. It's uh, not in, built to modern standards. It's uh, another part of my job is trying to solve the dam problem. But, I'll talk about that. Um, but what, what did happen with the dam, you know, we are downstream, Conestee Nature Preserve is downstream of urban Greenville. So for all those decades, um, we didn't have environmental laws, we didn't have environmental protections, whatever textile mills, the railroads, the uh, coal plants, whatever they put, whatever contamination pollution they created, they tossed it into the nearest water body, which was more often than not the reef, and that would come downstream, and because of the Conesty Dam, the water would slow down, and the contamination would fall out, right? So the, the original, if you were to go back and, and ask someone about Conesty 30 years ago, it's actually very often called Code Nasty, because of uh, all the contamination that had come downstream and settled out. And that's part of the story about how we came, we a nonprofit came to acquire this property. Frankly, you know, our organization, before my time, but um, our, our organization is the only entity crazy enough to buy such contaminated property and try to turn it into a nature preserve. Right? Um, but that's what we took on. Um, 22 years ago, our organization was formed. 15 years ago, uh, the nature preserve. Is open to the public. And over the years, sediment has flowed downstream, that contamination has gone further and further underground. And today we have this incredible resource. 99.9% .9 of people who show up don't know about that. Their legacy of justice to come. <coughs> an amazing asset that abounds with life. And, and to me, that's the really there, there's several things that are uniquely valuable about Conestee. Like our location uh, provides this incredible opportunity. To reach people, and, and not just people, but because we are the 640-acre island of nature, surrounded by I-85, Walton Road, Strip Mall, and manufacturing centers, we have an abundance of wildlife. Right? If you come for a walk in Conestee, 
especially on a warm day, spring days like now, if you were to walk, uh, if you were to walk a mile at high speed on a spring day, odds are you're going to see a snake. Uh, maybe, maybe you like that, maybe you don't. Um, but there's lots of other species that's around as well. If like someone were to, if we were here in the city on a spring day, right? if someone were to ask me five years ago, are there otters in the city on a spring day? I would have thought, no, no, of course there's not. There's not space for otters. But we have otters in high speed. We have an incredible array of wildlife. Um, and that wildlife enjoys habitat that still, even after uh, being on the job now for 15 months, it still really blows me away in, in how it looks. Right? This is like an image to me from Florida, right? or at least the, the coast of South Carolina. We have these incredible aquatic resources by virtue of being adjacent to the Reedy River um, that are home to uh, an incredible abundance of wildlife. Um, I have to include my cute baby deer picture. Uh, but um, which are you know coming out soon. Um, but the, the type of wildlife that we're known for to preserve more than any other is of course bird life. Yeah, I think the number is 233 species of birds that have been spotted in the preserve, which is more than anywhere else in Greenville County and more than anywhere else in the United States except for one other location. So more than you know these these things, you know, table rocks, either sheds. Um, state parks have been around a long time. Um, more bird species spotted there, uh, economy than many of the <laughs> Again, it just made it uh, not, I don't look at that and say, oh, yeah, you're built. Um, it looks more like a, um, a coastal scene. Um, some affiliated woodpeckers there. Right now, if you're, if you're, if you haven't been to the preserve in a while, now is the perfect time to visit because we have um, a natural occurrence, a yearly natural occurrence playing out right uh, it's really incredible to watch, and that's our uh, great blue here in Brooklyn. So every year um, we have somewhere between five and ten great blue heron nests. Here you see a uh, great blue heron carrying a stick uh, for nest building materials. So these birds are, uh, you know, they're they're over, can be over four feet tall. Uh, adult great blue herons are four feet tall, right? So the kids that come out to the nature are obviously like taller than you, you know, bigger than elementary school. Bigger than my daughter, taller than my daughter. Um, and they start, you know, the, the pairs are in the nest and then the baby born. We, we just got our first glimpse of the of the hatchlings this week. So the babies are out and they start as tiny little fluffy things. And in a period of um, fewer weeks than you would think, they grow into these very substantial birds. And it's just incredible to see, you know, 20 of these birds uh, in, in trees and nests, uh, you know, caring for, for their young. But of course, you know, in addition to, you know, our baseline is protecting that habitat, protecting the nature, but we do that to, our goal is to bring people to preserve, to enrich folks, and to send them back into the community to be more educated, uh, maybe to have a more sophisticated or more um, conscientious view of nature. But our, our, our ultimate goal is to change people uh, for the better, so that we make a difference beyond the boundaries of the And we really built, I would love to, Claim credit for it, but I can't do it uh, because it's a little one time. We have this incredible um, selection of boardwalks and other amenities uh, <laughs> that bring you in very direct contact with nature. That's another thing that's very unique about Conesty is how close you get to everything um, by virtue of our boardwalk system. Um, if you're if you're wondering, it's also very expensive. That's mine. I feel like I'm the, I'm like the grumpy dad in our office. I'm always the one that's like yelling about money. Yeah. Turn down the thermostat. Uh, boardwalks are very expensive to maintain, but also incredibly valuable. Uh, I have to show off my two nephews there on the left. Looking cute, right? But um, we try to, uh, we really pride ourselves on our ability to engage and educate children, which brings me to our education program. So we have uh, two and a half right now, two and a half full-time educators on staff. And we have a variety of education programs that we offer including field trips. In a typical year, we, um, we offer field trips to, uh, or we, we, we're visited by approximately 4,000 uh, children on field trips. Uh, we teach them, we customize the lessons to their, um, to their grade, uh, grade level. Um, and, and, and really, the, the amazing thing to see is like the, the, the transition and the change that these children go through during their time with us. Um, 
I'll talk about this in a, in a second, a nature deficit. We have children that arrive, we have elementary school kids that arrive to the preserve that are scared to take a, a basic walk through the woods, right? The only thing they've seen about nature is on movies and TV, you know, just a snake or a wolf chasing someone through the woods. And just a simple walk through the woods is scary. You know? uh, but the great thing about kids, as opposed to us, uh, as we get a little older, is they're very flexible and they're very easily molded. And um, we are able to take um, those students in a very short amount of time and, and transition them from saying, quite literally, scared to go in the woods to saying, this is the best day ever, right? That's an actual one. example of something that's happening. So our field trip programs, we also offer uh, after school for students, right? They literally get your hands dirty. Um, you know, the way that we try to teach uh, at Costi is allowing the students' creativity and, and sense of wonder to be the guy, right? Uh, we, we, all, we try not to do what I'm doing to you now, just stand up in front of them and lecture to you, right? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very exploratory, um, experiential form of education. Um, and, and my favorite part, so I, I come from a family of educators uh, to a ridiculous degree. My mom, dad, brother, and sister all are public school teachers. My aunt and uncle, uh, so every first cousin except for one, like everybody I know is a public school teacher. One of the reasons why I love to practice law and came to class is because uh, of our education program. How strongly I felt about that. And I don't feel strongly about, there's no component that I feel more strongly about than our summer camp, right? So summer camp is something that we offer for middle school students uh, that come from an economically disadvantaged background and have an aptitude for science in the outdoors. So it's through a nomination process. And the idea is we bring these students out, uh, the sort of students because of their background wouldn't have the opportunity for uh, paid camps where you get all of these, all of these experiences. But they come to Conesty, it's entirely free, and it's really an incredible um, experience that they get to have, right? Things like they, they go to, they start out in Conesty in, in the Reedy River there, take water samples. Then they go to the Reedy River in Falls Park, take water samples there. Then they go to the, to the very top of the watershed up in the mountains and, and take water samples and test and compare those in laboratories. They use electroshock. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you send a, a jolt of electricity through the water and it stuns the fish and they float up and then you can take an inventory of the fish. And with a few exceptions, the fish are fine. Uh, and get back to, them, to their lives. Uh, but like really incredible, like science, like the, the idea is for them to leave after the camp and be able to really see themselves as scientists uh, or, you know, some um, outdoor natural um, scientific career. So it's a really incredible experience. But it's not just all about, you can't let the kids have all the fun and get all the attention. <laughs> we also have Saturday programs, and I would encourage you all to keep an eye out for, for those things. Um, we, we do this a couple of Saturdays a month, and it really uh, runs again, right? We have um, this is a, a birding, a birding walk, right? We have birding, um, we have uh, we have Writing in our all of the, the it's all over the place, but the common theme is using nature, engaging with resources um, to learn or um, to be inspired, right? Um, and that can include uh, things like bird watching. It can also include things like yoga. And every once in a while, we'll just do something that's just fun. We don't learn anything, like our Valentine's wine walk, uh, where there's no learning going on, but everyone's having lots of fun. And this is a scene from our Valentine's wine walk. We, you walk from station to station, enjoy the meal, and, um, and pair with the wine sample. We have other major events. We have a, our big event coming up Friday, which, um, look at the weather, it's supposed to be 60 degrees and winds at 25 miles per hour. So um, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> um, we're going to move this up. Anyway, we have, a, we have a host of events, uh, both educational and just enjoyable, where you can come out of the preserve. Our goal is to um, make our property a community resource and um, to offer it um, for that purpose to raise as many people uh, as we can. So I mentioned the concept, that's sort of where we are today. Um, I mentioned the concept of this nature deficit disorder, right? Um, it's really interesting if you 
we, we experienced this uh, in the office. We were trying to prepare a presentation about, um, about education for children and, and uh, Google, um, like children's stream or something like that. And, and what came up was children's stream, looking at iPads, uh, looking at electronics, not children in a stream, but children's stream um, on their electronics. Um, and especially with uh, the health crisis over the last couple of years, just drastically increase the number of children that are spending uh, in order more greater than six hours a day uh, in front of a screen. Um, the nature de deficit disorder has is, is become a, a concept that um, is, has come to the forefront, especially with the health crisis. And the, and, and the reason for that is that not just because, um, you know, being outdoors, exercise, that sort of thing. Um, multiple studies have demonstrated that time Experiencing the outdoors, exploring the outdoors, learning in the outdoors uh, is critical for childhood development, right? So coming out of the health crisis, um, seeing what we see at the preserve in terms of the change in children and the time we've been doing our education, just in the 10 years we've been educating, um, we decided that you know, a new, um, more substantial, um, more flexible approach uh, to educating the preserve to counteracting this nature deficit disorder um, was appropriate. And what we have done, what we've come up with is our nature play kit, right? uh, which if you're gonna describe it in simple terms, is a playground without playground equipment. This is a, kind of a definition that doesn't really tell you anything. That's my favorite kind of, as a professor, that's my favorite kind of definition. Um, but, I'm sure that a lot of us, a lot of you all had the same experience that I did and that it was very common for me growing up to just walk out of my house, go into the woods behind my house and explore without my parents there, without any supervision, um, turning over logs, uh, building forts, um, you know, climbing on branches, just, have, just exploring into the woods, right? And, and the idea of play, it's not a pejorative term in this, in this context, right? We're talking about the kind of exploratory, experiential play that's critical for development, right? And especially in our community, we're an urban, suburban community. Of course, you know, parental fears uh, have also risen over the years, right? Fewer and fewer children uh, are getting that experience of unstructured exploration and engagement in the outdoors. So the purpose of the space is to recreate that in a controlled and durable environment, right? So it, you hear the word nature playscape. Um, it will look very much like nature, right? But beneath the surface of that nature will be expertly designed elements. We've retained a nationally renowned uh, design company uh, that will incorporate uh, uh, elements like uh, this, is a, this is a playscapes are a, a amenity that Growing in popularity significantly across the country. Um, they're in locations like Cincinnati and St. Louis, and uh, there's dozens across the country. This is an image from the St. Louis place, state, right? The man made water body where children can splash around, can move rocks and see how it affects the stream flow, you know, extrapolating that to the exact same kind of impact you see in the preserve with, with the, the Reedy River. Um, climbing, exploring, the idea, and, and I'm not a if one of our, our professional educators is here, they could um, explain this to you uh, better than me. But the idea is with the regular playground, you engage with every element in a predetermined way. You slide down a slide, you cross the monkey bars. Um, but with these, uh, with the elements of the playscape, there is no predetermined way to engage. So it requires creativity, it requires exploration. Um, and as a result of that, it's a much more engaging way Experience. So we have committed to building uh, our playscape and preserve uh, this year. We've retained designers, and um, you know we're uh, in the midst of fun fundraising for that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, so that's one of our big projects. You know, when I when we came in, it, it's always I, I joke about um, about. Uh, now in the nonprofit community, having a very, uh, feeling very comfortable about it. But then, you know, over time, you realize like you have to, you have to do it to do the work, right? Simple as that, right? So, so our, one of our big initiatives last year, um, 
in my first year on the job was to start our friends group, uh, which is more than just a, a way to get money, right? We've, we've tried to build that into the community of people that care about Conesty and support Conesty. We have, uh, we have special events. We have special access to tickets. We have a very sleek and stylish merchandise. But our objective um, through that program has been uh, to build a more sustainable uh, financial base. Um, you know, over the years, Conesty has been a place where we saved every screw. Uh, and that's very nice to take time to remove every screw from the boardwalk and reuse screws. But, you know, uh, it takes 30 minutes to... Um, to, to salvage five screws, maybe not the best uh, use of our time, right? So we're, we're trying to move toward a more sustainable financial ba uh, base so that we can do more good um, for the community. Um, and uh, last slide I have here is a couple of other things. I don't know if we have any mountain bikers in the group. Our other big initiative this year uh, is a, a mountain biking. We, our big challenge is to preserve is balancing competing uses, right? Um, my unobservant second grade daughter never looks where she's going. Uh, cannot, um, it's not a very good trail mate for aggressive mountain bikers, right? Uh, neither you know, burgers and mountain bikers are not uh, very good trail partners, right? So um, before I started the preserve, the decision was made to exclude mountain bikers um, based on trail conflict. We have decided to take a more nuanced approach now and that we are going to open up um, trails in a part of the preserve that's it's away from the main body of the preserve. It's a section of the preserve that very few people know about um, and that is seldom used. And we're going to um, retrofit uh, some of the trails there to be mountain bike specific and then tie into uh, the greater Swamp Rabbit uh, trail network. So we have, a, we have a very difficult job and that we, we want to uh, we want to be everything to everybody, right? Uh, and uh, we do our best to balance out all of the realizing that at the end of the day, we're like, the, way, the reason why Conesty is special is because it is off the place here. So um, I have some materials here. I have uh, a printed map that you can are you welcome to take. I have some newsletters. I have some stickers. I have some cards uh, for our friends group. And I have a sign-up sheet for our newsletter. If you sign up for that, we get our electronic newsletter, get our print newsletter, we'll send that out. Um, and other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all may have. There's another, there's a county. One part. second, I'm going to let you use the microphone because we do have people on Zoom that want to hear the question. And if you could repeat the question, Michael, that would be great. Okay? Great. Uh, there's a, a county park downstream. From you, Cedar Falls. Cedar Falls. Right. Cedar Falls. Cedar Falls. The dams, the old millside. A wonderful place. And that, do you know how far that is from one to the other? Is it conceivable that those, your property and that one might one day be linked by trails or, or something? It just seems to me it would really exponentially improve the experience uh, if those. Uh, Two properties could be linked up somewhere. Sure. So the question was about Cedar Falls and linking this property. So Cedar Falls, you have Conesty Dam, which is the first dam south of Greenville, and then Cedar Falls uh, is the second dam south of Greenville, right? Another another mill dam, uh, and it is several miles downstream. Yeah. Um, there is discussion about extending the Swamp Rabbit Trail in that direction toward Lawrence County. Now that is a um, years down the road uh, project. Um, I, you know, we are always looking to explain, expand um, the preserve, to be sure. Uh, that comes with a couple of obstacles, one being cash, two being we're in an urban setting and there's not that many large tracts, right? It's tough, to, it's tough to build a nature preserve when you're acquiring quarter acre lots at a time. Um, but expanding in that southern, southern direction, especially um, on the Swamp Rabbit Route, is something that there's at least conversation around. Right? Imagine having a special trail for mountain bikers. Mm -hmm. Are you going to restrict mountain bikers from the other trails? That's right. Yes. So, will there, there still be other bike, other bikers can use trails in the bike? Mountain bikers 
So, so bikers, as it stands now, bikers are allowed to use our paved trails, right? And that will continue. Um, there's a section of the preserve, you get one of our maps. There's the main body of the preserve that everybody, almost everybody assumes is all of Conesty. Then there's the Brazil farm section of the preserve, which has an entirely different parking lot. It's not connected to the preserve. Um, it's not an area that, you know, the most cars I've ever seen there is two. Uh, but it is very gorgeous. It's a gorgeous piece of property. Um, it's upstream of the main body of the preserve. And, and, and the trails will continue to be open to walkers. It's just that you'll also understand that, hey, for this small subset of trails, you may encounter mountain bikers as well. And, and one of the reasons why we're doing it, I mean, frankly, we encounter a great deal of um, unauthorized mountain biking. Uh, I see a mountain biker uh, one out of every five times I go out of the preserve. So I hope, um, it, it, in a similar concept to the playscape, right? Our hope in creating the playscape is we see fewer kids tromping around in, in wetlands that we'd like to protect, right? If you want to play and engage with the resources, you go to the playscape. Same thing with the bikes. If you want a mountain bike, you don't sneak in and do it against the rules. You have this very des this designated area where we sort of control the impact. Jessica, do you have any uh, questions on your end there? Hold on, I have one. Let's see. Let's see. Um, somebody asked, <clears throat> is there a published schedule of the Saturday events? Yeah, is there a published schedule of Saturday events? Yes, there is. Uh, there, it's on our website. Um, and we, uh, we try to post those a couple of months out so you can schedule around those. If you're at the preserve, it's also, um, there's, Advertisements on our kiosks where you can also see uh, those events. I know there's a Burning 101 event coming up. Um, trying to recall some of the other things. Our main fundraising event, which is Friday. Um, but there, there's a variety of things that you can find on our website. Michael, um, yes, what are the long plans for the landfill area? So um, we have a, our property is very, we're very lucky to have some great partners at Conesty. Uh, I said it's a 640-acre preserve. The truth is we don't own all that acreage. Uh, part of that is owned by Rewa, our local wastewater utility, who opens their property up, and we have trails on Rewa's property. You wouldn't know when you cross from our property to Rewa's. Same thing with the city of Greenville, who owns the landfill. So um, I was really, I, I was a fairly regular Conesty visitor before I took this job, but I was blown away to find all the things I didn't know about uh, when I started the, the gig. And one of those is our landfill property, which is um, a, a giant grassland. It, sound, it doesn't sound very picturesque, a landfill, right, hiking around in a little landfill, but we get bird, we get bird species um, and, and other species in that habitat that we don't get anywhere else in the preserve. And um, the city is planning to can, can, can continue that as a green space, one, right, primarily. That's important. I don't know if it's going to end up owned by Conesty, but the current discussion is to reroute the Swamp Rabbit Trail to run along the bottom of the landfill so that instead of the Swamp Rabbit Trail running through Conesty, directly through Conesty, um, Conesty is sort of an exit. You know, if you want to you want to jump off the Swamp Rabbit and explore Conesty, you can do that. Um, but discussions between us and the city have kind of reflected that a nature preserve doesn't make sense to be a main thoroughfare of the Swamp Rabbit. Instead, it can be an exit ramp um, with the primary route of the Swamp Rabbit running along the bottom of the landfill. So those are the, the plans that I'm aware of with that property. How large an area is the playscape? Two. Involved. The place gives two acres, and um, if you're familiar with the preserve, it's it's up beside the baseball fields. Um, we predict we picked an area that um, it's uh, you know has relatively low ecological value. Uh, it's not utilized by birders or, or wildlife um, watchers. Uh, so it's a part of the preserve that is um, kind of underutilized, doesn't have aquatic resources. Uh, and it's adjacent to an area that's already disturbed, the baseball fields. How, how 
much of the refuge or preserve is you know, floodplain? How much of the refer how much of the preserve is floodplain? Well, you know, I don't have the exact number on that. I can tell you that. Oh, a lot. Yes, that's a good answer. I'll, if you take a look, so um, I'll try not to go too professorial here. But take a look at the Reedy River. It starts in Traveler's Rest and ends in Lake Greenwood, Short River. Uh, if you take a look at the river through Greenville, really from TR on down to Costi, there is barely any floodplain and wetland left of the Reedy River. Over the years, it's all been filled in, right? Uh, back in the day, we did things in Greenville was crazy. The Reedy River was literally straightened. The railroad companies dug a new river, dug a ditch basically, and rerouted the Reedy to straighten it so that uh, the railroad tracks could be straight. <laughs> so uh, over the years, we've lost um, almost all of our floodplain. Um, but Conesty has this enormous expanse of wetland and floodplain. This serves a very important value in terms of water quality, right? We're downstream of Rewa, our wastewater um, utility. And believe it or not, during the summer, during the dry or summer months, when, um, vege when vegetation is sucking up lots of, of moisture, the majority of the Reedy River that we get is wastewater discharge from Rewa. Um, and our uh, preserve and the floodplain and wetlands that are there serves a really critical role in improving the water quality of, of that, of the, of the reed that flows down that way, right? Um, Rewa is very happy to have us. We're basically like a, another element of their wastewater treatment facility. And it's just nature. It's just floodplain and wetlands, which is why those, those resources are so valuable. Good question here. One more. I'll take one more. We've got one more and then I'm going to pop it in front. Okay. Sure. Hi, Michael. Hello. So, my question is to do with the space <coughs> next to the preserve. I was there on Accelerate and the C 130 just kept going over and over. So, I don't know what kind of plan you have or, or if there's discussions with. Them in terms of how low they fly over the preserve? It's, um, it is very problematic and it's more problematic. I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. The question was about the Donaldson Center and their, um, their noise from uh, their airplane noise. Um, now that they have, are working with the fighter jets, it's even louder. And it's not just an issue for Conesty. I have um, Facebook friends who live and work along Augusta Road that have been asking on, on, on social media what is with the, all the sudden noise is a, a big problem. Um, I've met with um, representatives of SCTAC who run uh, the place and, and I've not gotten anywhere. Um, it's one of those things where, it, you know, um, as a lawyer, right, uh, having spent my career as a lawyer, you can either you can always take the friendly approach or the unfriendly approach. And um, we've been trying to take a friendly approach and um, haven't gotten anywhere. I think at the end of the day, it's there's not a very good mechanism for us to like compel them to change their behavior. I think it's a political fix, right? The Donaldson Center is owned by the city and the county. So at the end of the day, the city and the county um, has the levers to pull. And um, I, you know, I can't pro I can't say that I've made great progress, but I think at the end of the day, it's um, it's a situation where we need to talk to our elected officials of the city and county and let them know how big the problem it is. As an environmental lawyer, there have been cases about this, like, but there has to be. And there's no endangered species at Conesty, right? If there was an endangered bird using the preserve, we could you know make them change their behavior using the Endangered Species Act. But there's just not that much we can do in terms of compelling action. But that doesn't mean that we can't. Um, ask our elected officials to stand up for uh, for us. Okay, um, I'm wondering. I see the boardwalks, and you mentioned paved some paved uh, walkways as well. If I were to go out there, I'd walk usually with a cane or a walker. Um, is there how much space would you say I could? From the beginning to the end of that um, accessible space, 
the, the questions about accessible space and uh, and, and hard surface trails to walk on. Thank you for asking that. My friend Marcia told me to mention that. I totally forgot about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have, so we have designed, we redesigned our map last year and specifically designed a route um, that is designed for accessibility. So it involves, it, it only it is a loop that is paved in boardwalk exclusively. All right. So you can follow our, let me make sure I get the color right. You can follow our yellow loop, which is 2.2 miles, and you won't leave, um, you won't leave asphalt or boardwalk. That's a simple question. There are other places you can walk as well, but that's a good starting point. Another one. Right, well, I'm interested in the Friends Group. Uh, oh, good to hear. Friends, and are there opportunities to volunteer uh, on site? We do. Uh, the questions about Friends Group and about uh, volunteer opportunities. We have um, a volunteer sign up on our website. If you were, uh, you can access that. If not, you can certainly call or email, and we will enter your information in. We have a variety of uh, volunteer needs, you know, we can um, we can have you out there uh, shoveling mulch, or we can have you <laughs> in the office, you know, using your brain, right? We have a wide variety of, uh, of volunteer needs, and, and we are really trying to uh, make uh, even better use of, of the, the wonderful support we have in terms of people's interest in volunteering. As far as the Friends Group goes, there's a sheet up front that, that explains the different levels and different benefits of the Friends Group. And there's a card you can take with you um, so that you can access that later uh, if you don't want to make that decision now. I have a question, Michael. Every uh, couple of years, we get an article in the Greenville newspaper, which we, we used to be one around, but now you got to get online, talking about the dam, the dam dam that you were talking about, and uh, what a uh, ecological disaster it would be if we had a problem with it. What's uh, going on? When, when y'all see my face, do I, do I look like the kind of guy you want to give thirty-one million dollars to? I do, right? <laughs> uh, that's what we're asking the state to give us right now. So um, we are in a really unique uh, moment um, for solving that problem. In that um, the federal government's throwing lots of money around for infrastructure, so there are funds available. Um, that, are, that are being distributed by the uh, state legislature. And we have been working very hard um, to get our name at the top of that list. Um, no guarantees yet, but um, great progress. I mean, the um, it's it is simply a matter of money, right? I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're, we have seven employees. We're not a tiny organization. Uh, but we can't solve a $30 million problem on our own. Um, so uh, we think we have um, a unique opportunity, uh, and uh, we should know about it in the summer. I'll say that as far as the condition of the dam goes, you know, the dam, um, the, the main risk to the dam is seismic activity, right? So it's, it's earthquakes causing the dam to shift uh, that are the bigger concern um, than, than flooding. You would be amazed at how little water it constantly looks like a very wet place, and you see this open water. Truthfully, the deepest water at Constantine is about five feet deep. Um, over the years, the lake has filled in so much that the dam is actually does not hold back that much volume. So um, the flows over the dam are not as big a concern as um, seismic activity. Uh, and the dam is intact. It's just it's not designed to the standards that we would design. It doesn't have a safety factor. That we were designed to today because it was built by a bunch of craftsmen 130 years ago. It's an incredible piece of architecture. It's absolutely amazing. I aspire to have constant patrons be able to get closer to it and see what an incredible um, piece of history it is. Uh, and, the, and the most recent proposals for replacing the dam involve building a structure behind the dam so that we can leave that historic face uh, intact. No other question. One other question. Uh, we had Ty Houck in here talking about the extension of the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Um, can you ride from Walden Road on a trail to Conesty yet, or is that still closed, or what is the status of that? Um, so you have to 
if you if you're riding the swamp route in Conesby, uh, you have to ride through the neighborhood to connect to the greater system of the swamp route trail. Yeah. It's just a disconnected system in that area because of some uh, community opposition, which is why I'm sure Ty talked about it. But the, the most recent conversations are about um, giving up on that route that's been in consideration for many years and taking the route through the Clemson Eye Car Center. Um, sort of back behind Mall and, and, and down um, by Jail Man High School. So that route would um, would allow um, Costi to be connected to, to the greater system. And we've had some really productive meetings on that before. It's not a 10 year thing, it's a you know, one or two year thing. Uh, I wonder if there's a plan to connect the natural areas of Rainville County uh, for the sake of animals and well, birds and everything you know, um, that uh, other people are trying to do in the country. Yeah, it's a tough thing. I mean, you're, you're, it's a great question. And it's a tough thing to do. And certainly there have been plans like that. Uh, in the northern part of the county, right, where there's still these very large tracks. Um, in urban and suburban in Greenville, we still do are lucky enough to have a fair amount of connectivity along the Reedy River corridor. And um, I'll say, you know, I mentioned them several times, uh, and I'm not paying to uh, endorse them, but uh, we are very fortunate um, in this community to have Rewild as our wastewater utility because. You know, you run your wastewater lines in low lying areas, which usually along rivers and creeks, and they are very, um, they are very green, and it's not just green washing like a lot of corporations do. They are very conscientious of environmental impact. They're very supportive of environmental preservation, and because they own a lot of those um, river corridors, where you know, just sort of through happenstance, you've got a pretty decent connected network. Uh, at least along the, the major uh, water bodies in, in the Greenville area. I haven't heard any conversations, um, deliberate conversations about um, connectivity, um, but uh, it's, you know, it is something that we're all aware of, but uh, I haven't seen anybody look at that yet. Jessica, any other questions on the Zoom? Yeah. Um, Mary asked, um, has the owl family that was displaced by that big wind recently found a new home? Oh boy. Oh. <laughs> I've asked this question. <laughs> um, well, so we had a great, sad, a little sad I have a joke I can tell after I told it. Um, so we had these great horned owls, which are really an incredible bird that I've never seen before. Um, giant owls that had built uh, a nest in an old in one of the old heron nests so it was a uh, male and female owl and two owl chicks that everyone had been watching very closely watching them develop uh, it's really interesting they, they are very skilled predators you see you know dead creatures hanging over the edge of the nest all the time um, so what was it Andrea, what day was it? It's like last Saturday. Yeah, not, not Saturday. Mm, ten, ten or so days ago. Um, it was a very windy day, and the nest, uh, the branch that the nest was in, snapped off, and the two baby birds came toppling down. And one of them uh, immediately uh, perished. One of them uh, was rescued by a rehab uh, and was taken to the the vet where it was determined that um, its hip and other leg bones were broken in an irreparable way and had to be uh, so unfortunate. Um, so it is the, the silver lining, if there is one, is it is early enough in the season where those great horned owls could nest again. Um, so they may uh, nest again um, this year. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things, you know, nature. Is not right or wrong. It just uh, it just is, um, and it's not always easy to watch. But um, it's it is unfortunate. So fingers crossed for for this windy period we have coming up for our, our baby years. I feel like I have to soften it after that and say you know, I, sh I should let you guys know that I um, I endorse podiums. 
This is a product I can really stand on. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, everything else is great. Your jokes, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, we have another show that Michael has, so you want to help yourself to it. And uh, again, Michael was great. Thank you. Thank you.